Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 40, Remastered. If you've been enjoying this series so far, you've followed me as I've explored the subject in the study of ecology. The first episode introduced ecology as a scientific field, as a discipline, and a way of looking at the natural world around us. And the second episode began with the examination of the different levels of ecology, starting with the behavioral ecology of the individual. The third episode increased the scale to examine groups of individuals and how these populations interact with other populations and with the world around them. For today's episode, I'm going to increase the scale once again to examine biological communities. Where a population is a group of individuals of the same species, a community is composed of multiple populations of different species, all of them interacting and coexisting in the same region or given geographic area. Communities are composed of different species, and they're defined and characterized by the ways that these species interact with each other. The natural world is kind of like a free-for-all game of eating, mating, and dying. The natural imperative of a species, from an evolutionary perspective, not an individual perspective, but from an evolutionary perspective of the population, is to adapt and evolve to maximize its fitness into its native environment. The fitness of an organism implies its capacity to keep itself healthy enough and safe enough to reproduce and create another generation, to perpetuate the species. In order to maintain their fitness, to survive and reproduce and raise healthy offspring, the organism must engage in some kind of behaviors. They need to eat and consume nutrients. They need to find a mate and reproduce. And they need to do all of this in such a way so as to avoid death by predation and disease. It's a rather tall order when you're playing in the free-for-all Super Bowl of death that is the natural world. All of these behaviors involve interactions with other organisms, with other species. All the predators eat some manner of prey animal and all herbivorous animals eat plants. And then you have the numerous bacteria, archaea, parasites, and assorted microbes and microorganisms that live on or in larger animals. These behaviors create complex species interactions that can become anything from an evolutionary codependence to a symbiosis to some kind of dangerous competition. These species interactions typically have some sort of influence over the fitness of the, of the species that are involved. A neat example of this are pitcher flowers, or other flowers that have deep basins, which have evolved to such a depth to keep out birds and insects from taking their nectar and maybe damaging their reproductive organs. But some species of small, fluid-feeding birds have also evolved longer snouts, and in the case of moths and butterflies, longer proboscis organs, so as to extract nectar from the deep flowers. Another example is the evolutionary arms race that happens between parasites, or pathogens, and their hosts. When the host evolves some kind of defense, the pathogen is now under selective pressure to evolve a way around it. The host will then endure the parasite for, uh, for additional time, until they can evolve another novel defense. The pathogen thus has to evolve another mechanism for infection to sidestep this second defense, and this goes back and forth and back and forth over millions of years. It's an evolutionary arms race. Species interactions can be categorized based on how they impact the fitness of the species involved. These interactions can be mutualist, they can be competitive, they can be commensal, or they can involve the outright consumption and digestion of the other species. I like to think of this as a spectrum of fitness outcomes from specific behaviors and interactions, with the spectrum having mutual fitness gains on one end where everyone benefits, and mutual fitness penalties on the other where everyone loses, or where everyone suffers a little bit more than they have to. A mutualist interaction between two species sees both of them enjoying a fitness benefit. Everyone wins in a mutualist relationship. A really well-known example of a mutualist relationship exists in that of the bee and the flowers that it pollinates. 
It's a mutualist relationship because both the bee and the flower gain. They, they both enjoy a fitness benefit. The bee will get the food in the form of nectar, which it slurps out of the flowers, and the nectar helps keep it alive and healthy and strong enough to care for bee larvae or to support the hive. The flowering plant is able to get the bee to act like a commercial jetliner for its pollen. It distributes its pollen between flowering plant individuals. This is because as the bee comes to the flower, the pollen will get shaken off and coat the bee's hair and legs. And so as the bee flies from one flower to the next, little bits of pollen will get shaken or brushed or scraped off. And this pollen will fall into the new flower to pollinate it, and it will allow the flowers to reproduce. This behavioral pattern has been so beneficial and so influential on their fitness that it's been ingrained evolutionarily in the flower's morphology and reproductive cycle. They use the bees as a vector, like a big flying bus to transport all of their gametes around. And the flowers are shaped, uh, their, their coloration and their shape and their odor is evolutionarily designed to attract whatever pollinating species they use, whether it's a bee or a butterfly or a termite or a bird. Another mutualist interaction includes the cleaner shrimp that eat the food out from the teeth of larger fish. Because one animal is able to get food, you know, the cleaner shrimp is able to eat, and the other organism, the, the larger fish, is getting its teeth clean, and that helps protect it from infection and gum disease and tooth loss. There's also the example of the microbes that live inside your gut and help you digest food. By helping digest your food, by, by helping break down all of the biochemicals in the food you've just consumed, the microbe is able to get some food for itself and some energy to sustain its own existence. And what you digest are the byproducts of its metabolism that it excretes and gives back to you, that you incorporate into your own body to help sustain your body and grow. And yet another example of a mutualist relationship exists in the fungus, that penetrate the roots of plants and expand their absorptive capacity within their cells, which allow the fungus and the plant to exchange nutrients and to support each other. The fungus has a greater surface area, and so it's better at extracting water and mineral nutrients from the soil, which it shares with the vascular plant. And the vascular plant is photosynthetic, so by being exposed to sunlight, it can produce sugars, and these carbon compounds can be given to the fungus to help the fungus grow its own tissues. This is a mutualist relationship because they both benefit. However, it's important to understand that species don't interact in a mutualist manner because they're being nice to each other. They aren't necessarily being altruistic. Sometimes, a mutualist relationship is just the easiest way for an organism to get what it needs, because a mutualist relationship typically requires a low energy investment for some kind of fitness reward. I mean, in the famous example of the bee and the flower, the bee doesn't understand anything about flower pollination. It, it's not really thinking about that at all. The bee is just going from flower to flower searching for nectar. And as it's doing so, it's incidentally spreading all of the pollen. The plants care about the pollen being distributed and they're reproducing, and the fact that they're able to keep reproducing and perpetuating themselves is proof that shaking their pollen off on these bees is a great way to help them reproduce. The bees seem to be checking them all out anyway, so why not give them their pollen? They don't seem to care or be inhibited by it, so biochemically, evolutionarily, it's going to happen. It's going to be selected for. Now, because of this, because sometimes species just aren't being altruistic and they're just going about finding the easiest thing for them to do, because of this, it's possible for one of the species in the relationship to cheat, in a manner of speaking, by deceiving or exploiting the other species. From time to time, flowers will do this to bees. The plant will cheat the bee by producing an empty flower with no nectar. The bee is attracted to the flower and it gets covered in the flower's pollen, and this helps the plant reproduce. But the plant doesn't bother to spend nutrients and energy producing the nectar, so the flower benefits, but the bee gets nothing. And if the bee happens to be nutrient-stressed, and it spent the energy flying up to that flower only to find that there was nothing there, that's wasted energy, and the bee can actually suffer. This takes me to the next category of interaction, down the spectrum a little bit from mutualism. 
This kind of interaction is called a commensalism, and commensalism occurs when one species benefit, but the other species receives nothing. No benefit, and generally no penalty. In most cases, commensalism occurs when an organism benefits in some way from the secondary effects of another organism's behavior. So let's say that an animal like a bear eats a pretty steady diet and has pretty consistent bowel movements. And there's an insect that digs through the bear's waist to find edible remains of the bear's original meal. Perhaps some part of it that was indigestible to the bear that the insect finds delicious. Now in this interaction, the insect is getting food because it's eating the waste of this other organism, so the insect is benefiting. But the other organism, that larger animal, the bear, it's not experiencing any gains or any benefits at all. Something digging through its waste doesn't have any effect on the bear. Now another example that's perhaps a little less gross is that of the ant birds and the ants that they follow through the jungle. The ants will march in large columns, in long lines that go out hunting larger insects and scavenging for food. As these columns of ants stomp around the jungle, the ants will end up disturbing the nests and the hiding places of their prey. Sometimes their prey will notice the column of ants advancing, and they'll try to hop out of the way. Sometimes they'll try to attack the ants, but they'll be attacked in turn. All of these disturbed prey species, which are usually insects, they'll, they'll flee away from the ants, but then they'll find themselves running straight into the beaks of the ant birds, which is a tropical bird that feeds on insects. The ants generally don't suffer, because their prey insects would have gotten away from them anyway. We're talking about the ones that fleed from the ants. But the bird gets the food. So the bird, these, these ant birds, will follow the columns of ants, and they'll position themselves in such a way so that when the ants disturb some nest of a larger insect or something like that, and it causes those larger insects to run away, the ant birds will be there, surrounding them, ready to catch them in their moment of terror. As far as military strategy goes, it's pretty insidious and effective. But in the natural world, fair's fair. The ant bird has to eat, and it's found a, a very effective way of doing so. Further down the spectrum of fitness outcomes, there's outright consumption, and this includes parasitism. A consumption interaction involves a clear benefit to one species and a clear penalty to the other, like when any predator captures and kills its prey, when any herbivore overeats a plant and causes too much tissue damage and when any parasite feeds off of its host. In each case, the consumer benefits, while the organism that is consumed suffers. The wolf gets food when it eats the moose. The giraffe gets food when it eats leaves from the tree in great abundance. And the tapeworm gets food when it infects and feeds off of its host. But the moose will suffer because it gets eaten, and presumably killed. The tree suffers because its branches can get ripped up, and its leaves get destroyed, and if the herbivore eats too much, this copious tissue damage can lead to long-term, if not terminal, health consequences. The tapeworm host will suffer because it's not able to get all of the nutrients that it should be getting out of the food that it's expending energy to acquire. Now, as you might assume, nature provides a hugely strong evolutionary pressure to avoid getting eaten. To this end, species have evolved an incredibly varied library of defenses and protection mechanisms. Camouflage can be evolved by prey to avoid detection by predators, or camouflage can be adopted by predators to help them sneak up on prey. This camouflage typically involves the animal adopting the color of its ambient surroundings. A snowshoe hare has a white winter coat, to blend in with the snow, which hides it from hawks and foxes. And in the summer, the snowshoe hare will develop a brown or a gray coat, which can better hide it in the underbrush and the dry summer vegetation. Camouflage isn't just limited to color, as it can also involve shape and texture. There are species of insects that look remarkably similar to leaves or twigs 
and their survival strategy involves them being able to pass as part of a plant. An insect-eating predator won't eat a plant, so it's going to ignore anything that looks like a leaf or a twig. The insects, which are behaving as replicators adapting to their environment, can fool their predators, and so they'll live another day to eat and potentially reproduce. Other times, an animal may join a herd or a school or a flock, which gives it protection through numbers. There's many species of fish that will swim in a school, where you have a lot of fish swimming in unison. This is an effective defense mechanism because their numerous reflective bodies can confuse and disorient any predatory fish that are trying to single out some prey to eat. The zebra has evolved its characteristic black and white stripes because when zebras are roaming together in a herd, these stripes make them all blend together, and predators have a very difficult time identifying individual zebras. In other cases, a herd will simply offer greater numbers of disposable bodies. If some kind of predator comes and attacks the herd, the herd will just run away, and the weakest and the sickest and the oldest among them will end up being the slowest, and they'll be the most exposed to the predator, and so they'll get attacked and killed by the predator. If you're a healthy bison or a healthy water buffalo or some kind of cattle, it benefits you to hang out in a herd, as opposed to hanging out by yourself. This is because if you run into a predator, like a pack of wolves, and you're all by yourself, that pack of wolves is probably going to kill you and eat you. But if you're in a herd, there's a number of weaker individuals, like the sick, the young, and the old, and these will linger behind to get killed by the pack of wolves, and this will give you a good chance to escape and live another day. You might think that this is brutal, and somewhat tragic, and a little cruel. And if it was humans doing this, if this was the human defensive strategy, you would be right, it would be. But we're talking about the natural world here. We're talking about replicators trying to optimize their chance of replicating. And so the lineage of replicators adapts to particular niches in the environment. For the niche of a large, grazing, herd-dwelling animal, the effective strategy for predator evasion is run away. By default, the slowest and weakest among you are going to end up filling the bellies of the predators that are chasing you away. But if you as a healthy young adult bison are able to escape, you can live another day. You can reproduce and pass on your genes. The replicator can replicate once again. In other cases, an organism may evolve a defensive structure, like armor plating, tough scales, a thick hide, or thorns or spines of some kind. All of these structures offer mechanical protection from predatory attacks, like the talons of a hawk, or the claws of a hyena, or what have you. Stuff like scales and armor plating offers passive protection. You know, your, your armor plating is always there. And so if anything is going to attack you, you can always count on your scales or your armor plating to be there to protect you. But some species have much more active defenses, like long, sharp spines or thorns or quills. The electric eel has a unique defensive capability, where it's evolved to send out a rapid electric pulse that hurts and scares away predators. Sometimes this electric pulse can be used to stun prey so that the eel can get a meal of its own. Sometimes a plant or an animal may evolve some kind of chemical defense like a poison to deter those animals that would eat them. This is most often the case in tropical amphibians, like tree frogs, which are usually colored with some very vibrant and bright pattern. Tree frogs can be neon green or a bright blood red or a fiery orange that drips away to a deep blue. All of these incredibly bright and colorful hues send a message to the predator that these frogs are full of nasty chemicals like toxins and poisons. If the predator eats the frog, it's going to get sick, really sick, and possibly die from it. So the predator learns to avoid eating things that have these crazy bright colors. Various plants can express chemicals that make their leaves taste bitter, 
which discourages a grazing herbivore from destroying their leaf tissue. Perhaps, most simply, a prey animal might evolve some kind of escape behavior, like a sudden leap backward, or the ability to move away quickly with a rapid sprint, or to play dead. Some escape behaviors are more complicated than just running away, like an octopus squirting ink, or a skunk expelling a noxious gas, or an insect spraying a predator with a blast of caustic abdominal juice. There are other, more subtle ways for a species to avoid becoming lunch, like mimicry. When one species evolves a trait that keeps away predators, then other species can benefit by evolving a morphological similarity to that first species. Mimicry was first described in butterflies and moths, and then again in a wider variety of insects. For example, think of a butterfly that expels a nasty odor, or has some internal chemical that makes it taste bitter and disgusting. Because of these defensive adaptations, predators will learn to avoid these butterflies. Now, if another butterfly happens to look like one of those that has a chemical defense, the predators won't eat it. The predators don't know that this second butterfly species doesn't actually have those internal chemicals that make it taste bad, but they just know that it looks like it, so they think it does, so they're just going to avoid it. They're not going to risk it. This creates a fitness benefit just for looking like a species that has some kind of active defense. And so this is where mimicry comes in. Other species of butterfly can adapt to have a similar appearance, a similar morphology. And even though they don't have chemical defenses themselves, the predators will still avoid them. There's two kinds of mimicry. You have Batesian mimicry and Mullerian mimicry. And these are defined based on the number of evolutionary participants. So in Batesian mimicry, one species will develop adaptations that make it look like another species. The species that it's mimicking is just doing its own thing. It isn't in any kind of co-evolutionary relationship with the species mimicking it. That's the case for Mullerian mimicry, which involves two species in a cooperative evolutionary relationship. These two species evolve to share similarities, so that they both mutually enjoy the benefits of repelling as many predators as possible. Alright, so I've talked about mutualism at one end of the spectrum, where both parties benefit, and then I talked about commensalism, where one party benefits and the other party doesn't, but it doesn't necessarily suffer either. Then I went over consumption, where one species benefits and another species, which is typically the one getting eaten, definitely suffers. Now I've come to the other end of the spectrum of interactions, where we don't have commensalism and mutualism, but instead we have competition. Competition between species causes them both to struggle, to suffer penalties to their fitness as they fight over scarce resources, like food or living space that they both need. This kind of interspecific competition occurs not just between species, but between members of the same species, in what's known as intraspecific competition. The basis for all of this competition, in every circumstance, is that the participating parties both use the same limited resource. If you've been listening to my podcast for a while now, you've probably heard me mention an ecological niche, or the role that any species plays in its local habitat, in its ecosystem. This niche is defined by whatever resources the organism uses, and whatever resources it produces. Your typical tree, whether it be an oak tree, a birch, or some kind of tropical tree, all trees have a very expansive niche. The tree is an autotroph, so it's a primary producer that absorbs energy directly from the sun and turns it into chemical energy. It doesn't feed on a prey species. So in this way, primary producers are very productive. The physical body of a tree also has a trunk and a canopy, and this forms a dynamic biological habitat for other species to live in, like tree lizards, or arboreal primates, or birds that nest in the trees. 
The tree produces leaves that other species can eat, or flowers that insects and hummingbirds can drink nectar from, or it produces fruits that other species can eat, or hollow out and live inside. So to tie this back into competition, when two species share an overlapping niche, they'll end up competing with each other. When two species both use the same food source, or they live in the same kind of shelter, they're forced to compete with each other for the limited resources. Competition over water can stress plants, and the availability of water, uh, and so the local availability of water will often determine the density of forests, where if a forest is too dense, it can become too water-stressed and the plants start to die off, until they reach a more sustainable density. The same mechanism applies to the canopy competing for sunlight. A tree's canopy can shade out other trees and prevent them from getting access to light. Alright, now there are two types of niches. A more theoretical concept is the fundamental niche, which is basically the entire possible range of the species given the right climate conditions and the available food sources. In contrast, there's the realized niche, which is some smaller segment within the fundamental niche that the species is actually known to occupy. For example, consider a species of flying insect that eats the leaves of a particular plant. In this case, the fundamental niche of the insect is basically anywhere that that plant species can also exist. Anywhere the plant can find its food, it can theoretically survive. But in some areas, there's a species of caterpillar. Both the flying insect and the caterpillar eat the same leaves. They're in competition for the same food resource. For the sake of the example, let's say that the caterpillar is much better at eating the leaves. It can eat them faster. Or perhaps the plant tissue has defensive toxins in it, and the caterpillar can tolerate those toxins much better than the flying insect can. For whatever reason, the caterpillar species is a better competitor, and the flying insect species cannot maintain its presence in the same regions as the caterpillar. In this case, the realized niche of the flying insect is the regions of the fundamental niche that don't have caterpillars there to outcompete them. I feel like that was too much of an abstract concept, so let me go over another example. Consider two species of birds that eat seeds. One species of bird is smaller, and it eats small and medium-sized seeds. The other species of bird is larger, and it eats large and medium-sized seeds. In this case, the niches of the birds don't completely overlap. The smaller birds are the only ones that go after small seeds, and the larger birds are the only ones who go after larger seeds. The only area of overlap is the medium-sized seeds, which both species eat, and thus, both species compete over them. Because a competitive relationship is an unstable relationship, one that deals out only fitness penalties, the two competing species will evolve to a more stable position. They'll evolve to coexist through a process called niche differentiation. In this case, the smaller birds will evolve to eat only the smaller seeds, while the larger birds will evolve to only eat the larger seeds. In this way, each species still maintains a food source, but now they aren't competing for anything. However, this doesn't mean that members of the same species aren't still competing against each other. It doesn't mean that you don't still have intraspecific competition. Because both species have started to avoid intermediate seeds, each species population is now eating out of a smaller total pool of available food. This will lead to intraspecific competition. This process of niche differentiation will also lead to a phenomenon called character displacement where the morphology, the physiology, and the behavioral patterns of the two bird species will evolve to settle into their distinct coexisting niches. In this example, the two bird species will experience character displacement as they evolve to adapt to a smaller range of seeds that they are willing to eat. Perhaps the smaller birds get even smaller and they evolve longer, more narrow beaks so as to better handle and manipulate smaller seeds. 
The larger bird species might evolve a heavier beak to better break apart the larger seeds. In essence, competing for the medium-sized seeds induced an evolutionary pressure on each bird species to prefer small or large seeds, as they would prefer to avoid competition. This evolutionary pressure fuels character displacement, where each species begins to adapt to its new, more limited diet. This is an example of a fitness trade-off. The smaller birds can better handle smaller seeds, but by becoming smaller and evolving a longer beak, they can no longer open even the medium-sized seeds. The larger birds can better break open the larger seeds, but this means that they're less likely to survive a drought. If this large bird species lives in a forest, and the forest experiences a drought, then the native plants that produce these large, nutrient-rich seeds will produce fewer seeds, they'll produce smaller seeds, and so there's going to be much less food available for the larger birds. These fitness trade-offs define a species, they define its niche, and they define its role in the habitat and in the ecosystem. In most cases, these fitness trade-offs and niches are shaped by species interactions that have been going on for thousands, if not millions, of years. This kind of heavily reinforced evolutionary pattern creates very stable communities, where every behavior and quality of an organism is integrated into the chemical orchestra of the ecosystem. When you understand the stability of an ecosystem shaped by natural selection for hundreds of thousands of years, you start to see why there's an inherent danger in an invasive species. It's like throwing a big rock into a still pond, which makes a huge splash and roils up all the sand on the lake bed. The invasive species comes in and destabilizes the new ecosystem. And this is because the behaviors and the actions and the biochemicals of the invasive species have not been tempered by the evolutionary responses of other species in the community. They haven't yet evolved niche differentiation, so the invasive species will come in and outcompete the native species and totally wreck their fitness. The invasive species might outcompete a native species at finding food or avoiding predators. The invasive species might be more aggressive, and it might violently seize the limiting resource, or openly attack its competitors. The invasive species might find a food source, and eat so much of it that they deprive that food to every other species in the native habitat that depends on it. In all these ways, invasive species pose a serious threat to the short-term and the long-term stability of community ecosystems. Alright, so far in the episode, I've limited my discussion to the nature of the various types of species interactions that help define a community. But these generalized types of interactions don't explain the full picture. This is because a community is composed of dozens, if not hundreds, or even thousands of species, and all of these have some kind of relationship with the other species in their habitat, in their community, either directly or indirectly. All of these relationships form an ecological web that rivals the human brain in its complexity. To study the community as a whole, biologists have to ask questions about the community as a whole. They have to look at all the species that live in a given community habitat, at all of the intra- and interspecific interactions, at all of the mutualist, commensal, competitive, and consumption-based interactions. One of the ways that biologists try to study communities as a whole is through a food web, or a hierarchical structure of predation with an apex predator at the top, herbivores near the middle, and plants at the bottom, with detrivores and scavengers there on the side cleaning up all of the dead stuff. Food webs are dependent on the habitat, and on the species that live within it. Another way to study community ecology is by observing a process called succession. This is a part of ecology that I find really fascinating, because it really demonstrates how life is like a self-perpetuating tide of carbon, literally growing upon itself and compounding. Life begets life, 
not just through simple parent-offspring reproduction, but through the emergence and the stabilization of increasingly complex ecosystems. This is called succession, the process through which an ecosystem becomes more developed, denser, more complicated, and capable of supporting larger and more diverse food webs. The first stage in the process is called primary succession. This occurs when some kind of life moves into an area as the first layer of biological substrate. Perhaps we're talking about a new volcanic island that just pushed out of the ocean, or a forest recently cleared by a forest fire, or a grassland that's been wiped clean by a flood. In any case, the habitat begins as an uncolonized expanse of land and primary succession begins when the first forms of life come in and begin to spread, be they plants, fungus, insects, or bacteria. For example, let's say that there's a dry field that's recently been disturbed by a forest fire, which has come through and cleared out all of the previous vegetation and forced out all the animals. The first species to return to the habitat and establish the primary succession would be weeds and small shrubs and ferns, grasses, and other rapidly growing plants. Through their frenzied growth, these first plants create a tangled mat of roots in the upper layers of the soil, and this stabilizes the soil, protecting it from being washed away in the rain or another flood, or by being blown away in the wind. I should mention that hundreds of millions of years ago, when life first appeared on dry land, the first macroscopic organisms to come aboard, so to speak, were fungus, whose thin hyphaea were able to creep into the cracks of the rock, between the grains and the crystals of the rock, and as they grew they would break the rock apart, and this splintering of the raw bedrock of the terrestrial surface led to the establishment of the first soils. This first primary succession of the dry landscape of the earth, it, it produced the soils, and this made the dry land more welcoming for plants who could establish roots in the dry soil. And once all that got going, well, you have the natural history of life on dry land. Now, however it happens, the stability of this primary stage of succession allows the second stage to begin, which is called the early successional community which sees the increasing abundance of longer-lived plants, like larger shrubs and flowering plants. These longer-lived plants will create a denser root mat, which penetrates deeper into the soil, and the shoots will grow higher into the air, which creates a thicker layer of biological substrate across the field. Insects and rodents and other small creatures are attracted to the blooming growth of the vegetation in the second successional stage, because now these, these attracted animals can come in and find food in the form of seeds, and flowers, and leaves, and plant shoots, and tubers, and all sorts of stuff. They can find shelter under the leaves and between the shoots. They can find shelter in the soil as they burrow into it. This second stage of succession is also where we start to see the effects of species interactions start to come about in full swing. Some species facilitate the presence of other species, like a plant that's required in the diet of some grazing mammal, or a fruit that's required for the life cycle of an insect, as some kind of chamber to house their eggs. Some species will inhibit the presence of other species, like a tall tree that blocks out light for a smaller, shorter plant, or some kind of insect that carries a pathogen that infects a larger animal, and so that larger animal has to, has to leave and has to get out of the range of the insect that carries that pathogen. All of this increasing complexity will usher in the third successional stage, which is called a mid-successional community. Here, the trend of increasing complexity will continue, and we see the emergence of plants that have even longer lives, like very large shrubs and small trees. The size of the ecosystem is growing almost exponentially, as the vertical space that's made available to various critters is greatly expanded. With the growth of trees, the community will start to see interactions with more and more species of birds, 
with more tree-dwelling mammals like squirrels and bats, and with more species of insect and lizard that are adapted to live on the tree trunks or up in the tree's canopy. This increasingly complex community can now support larger mammals, as the larger mammals now have enough biomass to graze upon, like the leaves of the trees. Larger mammals also means larger predators, which adds yet another layer of complexity to this growing community. The end stage of succession forms what's called a climax community. This climax community is defined by long-lived trees and other large plants, by large animals, both prey and a predator, and a huge variety of smaller mammals, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and insects, all of them buzzing around, living their lives, and doing their things, interacting with one another commensally, mutualistically, symbiotically, parasitically, or just by eating each other. The climax community is stable. It won't progress to any higher or more complex stage, because they've basically maximized their biological output. The nutrients that are being cycled through the ecology are being used up as readily as they're available. All available space is taken up. Food webs are set up and complicated. Species interactions are stable and balanced along cyclical relationships. The community has quite literally reached a climax, a zenith, in its complexity and stability. This ecological stability will persist until the next forest fire, or the next flood, or the next ice age, or the next volcano comes by and destroys everything and creates once more a barren field of disturbed soil. From this destroyed ruin, the process will begin again. Weeds and ferns will stabilize the soil. Larger shrubs and larger ferns will begin to appear, followed by flowering plants and smaller trees, and then larger trees, and with them an associated increase in the size and abundance of animals dwelling within the matrix of vegetation. All of these processes are predictable based on species interactions. The physical and chemical interactions of plant and animal species create these successional trends. They create this pattern of increasing complexity, coming to a head with the climax community. The total extent of the climax community is limited by the abiotic factors that work on a regional and a global scale. The planet receives differing amounts of light energy and heat from the sun based on latitude, and this difference in available energy is reflected in the species' richness and the diversity of the region. Equatorial regions tend to have high heat, stable climates with little to no seasonal differences, and very high humidity, which are all factors that heavily promote plant growth and enable the existence of huge, dense, climax communities in the form of tropical rainforests and steamy island jungles. At higher and higher latitudes, there's a lot less light, there's a lot less heat, and seasonal differences are much more extreme. And because of this, because these abiotic factors make life a lot harder in these higher latitude regions, there's a corresponding drop in the number and the abundance of available species. There's a corresponding drop in the complexity of the climax communities. I'll talk about all of this and more in the next episode on Ecosystems and Global Ecology. As for community ecology, that's about all that I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and I hoped you learned something cool, something that you found fascinating and that got you to think more about the natural world around you. If you like this episode, then hit the like button. And if you like all my content and you want to hear more of it, then hit the subscribe button. And if you want to support the podcast financially, consider buying something from the store or supporting the show on Patreon. And as always, thanks for listening.